You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. What's something you learned in history class that you feel like wasn't the whole truth? Better yet, what's something you didn't learn at all that was omitted completely? That's what I like to call redacted history. My name is Andre White, the host of the Redacted History Podcast, the place where history's forgotten events, heroes, and villains get their story told, one episode at a time. The Redacted History Podcast. Real history never dies. Stream the Redacted History Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to episode number 449 of our Civil War podcast. My name is Rich. And I'm Tracy. Hello y'all. Welcome to the podcast. First of all, we want to say thanks for your patience while we were moving. Using those old members episodes the last three weeks was really helpful since it gave us some breathing space to organize and pack and then move, and then start to get settled here in our new place. But we're excited to be back this week with a new show to share with you guys. And with this show, we're heading into the penultimate year of the Civil War. Although back then, of course, the soldiers and the politicians and the civilians on both sides couldn't look into the future, so they had no way of knowing that 1864 would be the next to the last year of the war and that the awful conflict wouldn't end until the spring of 1865. One thing we want to stress here at the beginning of this show is that as the calendar turned from 1863 to 1864, the ability and will of both sides to continue to wage war would be determined as much by what happened on the home front as by what happened on the front lines. And that's very important, so it bears repeating. As the calendar turned from 1863 to 1864, the ability and will of both sides to continue to wage war would be determined as much by what happened on the home front as by what happened on the front lines. As the war prepared to enter its fourth year in the spring of 1864, the terrible, bloody, costly, fratricidal conflict was trying the patience of both North and South. For Jefferson Davis, there was now a constant drumbeat of dissatisfaction with his administration's conduct of the war. Many Confederates from those states west of the Appalachian Mountains felt Davis had priority since the Federals controlled the entire length of the Mississippi River, and in addition, with Bragg's defeat at Chattanooga, Tennessee had been lost, and the Yankees now threatened Atlanta. Moreover, Davis was now confronting the reality that the concept of states' rights carried with it implications that were distinctly at odds with the Richmond government's attempt to successfully wage war and secure independence for the Southern slaveholding republic. In other words, states' rights, rather ironically, was proving to be an obstacle to the Confederacy winning the war. As we'll see in the coming year, governors from a number of rebel states, in particular Georgia and North Carolina, would place the narrow concerns of their states above the larger strategic needs of the increasingly hard-pressed Confederate States of America. And then, for Abraham Lincoln, the federal victories at Vicksburg, Gettysburg, and especially Chattanooga had dampened the disapproval of his administration's conduct of the war, as well as muted the criticism of those who believed the war wasn't worth fighting. 
Nevertheless, the Democratic Party, not to mention many officers and men in the Union armies, remained unhappy with the Emancipation Proclamation. And speaking of the Union armies, they would soon lose substantial numbers of soldiers who had enlisted for three years back in 1861. But the enthusiasm for the war itself had declined to the point where the North would have to fill the ranks of its armies either through conscription or the offer of large bounties to incentivize re-enlistment. Worryingly, though, the July 1863 draft riots in New York City had underlined the deep antagonism to the draft that existed among substantial numbers of Northerners. In addition, in the coming year, the North would face the unprecedented challenge posed by the necessity of conducting a presidential election in the midst of a civil war. That meant Abraham Lincoln would have to play a skillful political game, while at the same time continuing to manage the complexities of waging war. FYI, the re-election problem was one that Jefferson Davis didn't have to worry about, since the Confederate Constitution gave him a term of six years. Eighteen sixty four will prove to be a year of crisis on both the home front in both the North and the South. In the fourth year of the conflict, in both the Union and the Confederacy, the harsh realities of war will bite more deeply than ever. In the South, the effect of the war was felt not only in the absence of more than one-third of the region's white male population, but even more directly in the growing shortage of food, especially in the urban areas and near the fighting fronts. This shortage of food was ironic because the South was an overwhelmingly agricultural region, and at the outset of the war, Jefferson Davis had appealed to planters to shift from cotton to food production, but most had thumbed their noses at his request since cotton was a more lucrative crop. Indeed, if it could be run through the Union blockade, cotton offered bigger profits than ever in European markets. Yet, despite the planter class's devotion to the so-called white gold, the South nevertheless still produced enormous amounts of food, amounts that should have been adequate to feed its people. Why, then, was hunger stalking significant segments of its population? One reason was the lack of transportation to move food from where it was grown and raised to where it was to be consumed. Although the South's rail system had grown rapidly in the 1850s, it was still fragmented and partial. Unfortunately for the Confederate government, very few trunk lines carried rail traffic from one southern region or state to another. You see, most of the South's railroad tracks had been laid down with a view to carrying cotton and other produce from interior areas to ocean or river ports where it could be shipped to the markets of the world. Few of these small rail systems connected with each other, and it would have done little good if they had, since many had incompatible gauges, which was the width between the rails, which meant the rolling stock of one railroad company couldn't move on another railroad's tracks. The southern rail system's shortcomings were made worse by the stress the war placed upon it. This led to transportation problems, which resulted in foodstuffs tending to stay in the agricultural districts where it was grown and raised, rather than finding its way in sufficient amounts to the cities and Confederate armies where the need was greatest. Further exacerbating the difficulties southern city dwellers faced in attempting to purchase food was the impact of the Confederacy's method of financing the war. Wars are expensive. And not the least of the curses they bring on a society is the growth of that society's own government. What the government consumes or redistributes, the people must necessarily provide, whether they do so in taxes or by other means. Since the Confederate government never mustered the political will to impose the taxes necessary to finance even a fraction of its war effort, 
and since it was not very successful in obtaining foreign loans, it depended on printing presses, churning out thousands upon thousands of Confederate banknotes. The result was massive inflation, as the Confederate government sucked more and more of the value out of the money that remained in its citizens' pockets, bank accounts, or under mattresses. As prices soared, frustrated and angry Southerners condemned merchants and businessmen as war profiteers. As holding cash became more and more obviously a path to economic ruin, smart Southern businessmen tried to squirrel away their wealth in commodities instead, and the public labeled them hoarders and speculators, which were the worst kind of war profiteers. Preachers and newspaper editors lamented how such economic practices revealed the lost virtue of the Southern people, who now seemed to put personal gain ahead of devotion to their newly minted slaveholding republic. But, in fact, the culprit was their own government's economic policies, which made such practices unavoidable for anyone trying to escape economic ruin. Meanwhile, hardship steadily increased throughout the South, and with it, discontent. In the spring of 1863, that discontent flared up into open unrest. In April, in Richmond, a large mob composed mostly of women began breaking into shops and helping themselves not only to food, but also to clothing, shoes, and even luxury items such as jewelry. As the mob worked its way through the business district, the city militia arrived, and so did Jefferson Davis. The Confederate president climbed atop a wagon near where the militiamen stood in line, nervously holding their muskets. In a brief speech, Davis urged the rioters to return to their homes. Then he added, You say you are hungry and have no money. Here, this is all I have. And with that, he threw all the coins in his pocket into the, gr- into the crowd, which remained standing, sullenly glaring at the president and militia. Finally, Davis announced that if the street were not clear in five minutes, he would order the militia to open fire. He then pulled out his pocket watch and quietly watched the seconds tick off. Not until he instructed the commander of the militia detachment to order his men to load their weapons, Did the crowd begin to disperse, and before the five minutes were up, the street was empty of rioters. As ominous as the Richmond bread riot was, and despite the fact the Davis administration tried to squash any press coverage of the incident, it was far from an isolated event, as there were similar outbreaks of civil unrest and looting in several cities in Georgia and North Carolina. Clearly, the strains of war were beginning to tell on Southern society. Although suffering may have been more intense and was certainly more visible in the cities, it was present in the countryside as well. A large portion of the white male population was in the army, and many a farm was left to the efforts of a wife and such of the children as were old enough to wield a hoe. In many cases, the families left behind had been unable to raise sufficient crops, and their food supplies were dwindling. Since the Confederacy was literally years behind in paying its troops, the rebel soldiers had nothing to send to their families back home. In this situation, a steady stream of letters began to reach the Confederate War Department from wives requesting furlough or discharge for their husbands, so that the men could come home and help their families get in a crop. But to have given in to such pleas would have been the beginning of the end of the Confederate armies, and so the authorities declined these heart-rending requests. As the war progressed and the hardship became more acute, such letters increasingly were sent not to Richmond, but to the soldiers themselves, as desperate wives urged their husbands to obtain leave from their units if they could, or come home without leave so as to save their families from starvation. The fact that so many of the South's white men were in the army was another sign of the long reach and considerable power of the central Confederate government in Richmond, in defiance of the concept of states' rights. In 
The Confederacy had been well in advance of the Union in imposing national conscription, and its version of the draft was more rigorous and sweeping than the Northern version, demanding the service of every white male between the ages of 18 and 35, with the exception of certain classes and skills. Later, the upper limit of the draft was raised to 45. And then men of ordinary means complained bitterly about the 20 slave rule that exempted large slaveholders and overseers from duty in the ranks. Many politicians, such as Georgia Governor Joe Brown, raged against the draft as a violation of the principles of states' rights. But the Davis administration was undeterred, and conscription went on. Although in some regions of the South, draft resistors gathered in large bands and withdrew into the hills, woods, or swamps where they defied Confederate authority. Did archaeologists discover Noah's Ark? Is the rapture coming as soon as the Euphrates River dries up? Does the Bible condemn abortion? Don't you wish you had a trustworthy academic resource to help make sense of all of this? Well, I'm Dan Beecher, and he's award-winning Bible scholar and TikTok sensation Dr. Dan McClellan. And we want to invite you to the Data Over Dogma podcast. Where our mission is to increase public access to the academic study of the Bible and religion, and also to combat the spread of misinformation about the same. But, you know, in a fun way. Every week we tackle fascinating topics, we go back to source materials in their original languages, and we interview top scholars in the field. So whether you're a devout believer, or you're just interested in a clear-eyed, deeply informed look at one of the most influential books of all time, we think you're going to love the Data Over Dogma podcast. Wherever you subscribe to awesome shows. History never says goodbye. It just says, see you later. Edward Galliano was right when he said that. Events keep happening over and over again in some form. And that's the reason I produce the podcast, My History Can Beat Up Your Politics. What is it? We take stories of history and apply them to the events of today to help you perhaps understand them better. We are also part of Airwave Media Network. I've been doing the program since 2006. That's a long time, and the show has a long name. My history can beat up your politics. Find me wherever you get podcasts. The situation in the northern states was far different than that in the south, and although hardship might be felt in some families, particularly those whose breadwinners were in the army, the economy overall was booming. Yet despite abundance, the north was also experiencing significant social unrest as the calendar turned over from 1863 to 1864. The causes of the turmoil included general war weariness, discontentment with the conscription, and opposition to emancipation. War weariness affected all regions equally, but resentment of the draft and disapproval of the Emancipation Proclamation were closely related and combined to produce powerful effects in specific localities. Discontentment with conscription stemmed from an unwillingness to fight particularly for the cause of emancipation, and also from the perceived inequity of the rules Congress laid down for the administration of the draft. You see, out of the usual processes of compromise and legislative give-and-take had emerged the Enrollment Act of 1863. The law required every man between the ages of 25 and 45 to register, and then provided that the federally established quota of recruits didn't volunteer within a given congressional district, the draft would go into effect in that district and make up the difference. Congress had thought to soften the impact of the draft by providing two remarkably ill-conceived safety valves. 
First, a man who did not wish to serve had the option, if drafted, of hiring another undrafted man to go into the army in his place, thus securing permanent immunity from conscription. Naturally, such substitutes were bound to become expensive. So, in order to keep the price within someone's idea of reasonable bounds, the law also provided that a drafted man could pay the government a $300 commutation fee and go free, but only until his number came up again in a future round of conscription, if it ever did. Rarely was the law of unintended consequences more starkly on display than in this piece of legislation, since the $300 commutation price was still far out of the reach of an unskilled laborer for whom that sum might represent an entire year's wages or more. Substitutes were even more expensive. This situation led to unrest and complaints like similar grumblings in the Confederacy that the conflict was a rich man's war, but a poor man's fight. And so, although they were intended to mollify public annoyance with the draft, the commutation and substitution provisions of the Enrollment Act, in fact, became the focus of considerable agitation and discontent. In most congressional districts, efforts by local authorities succeeded in meeting the recruiting quotas. This was usually accomplished by offering cash bounties or bonuses for enlistment. However, a substantial number of the men who signed up turned out to be bounty jumpers, enlisting in one locality, collecting a large cash payment there, then deserting at the first opportunity to enlist in another town and repeating the process over and over until they either amassed a small fortune or were caught. They, as well as many of the substitutes who were hired, were of, at best, dubious value to the army, as were the conscripts who actually did find their way into the ranks. The latter made up only a small percentage of the total numbers mustered into the service, since the impact of the draft lay primarily in spurring voluntary enlistment. In other words, the draft was the stick, while voluntary enlistment was the carrot. However, in most areas, the net yield of the Enrollment Act was only a small trickle of men who turned out to be good soldiers, among large numbers of nearly worthless substitutes, shifty bounty jumpers, and unhappy conscripts. In some areas of the North, resistance to the draft was more intense and could flare up into violence. This was true in localities where popular opposition to the cause of emancipation ran high. In such districts, men angrily announced that they would not fight to free the slaves. Regions of particular resistance to the draft included the Ohio River Valley in the southern parts of Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois, but the furor was most intense among the Irish immigrant population that made up most of the lower class in New York City. In the summer of 1863, the Irish population of the city engaged in the war's most violent urban riot. For several days, mobs rampaged through the streets, killing policemen and blacks and burning buildings, including an orphanage for black children. In order to quell the riot, authorities finally had to bring in several regiments of troops from the Army of the Potomac. Some officials had doubts as to whether the soldiers would actually fire on the rioters. As it turned out, the veterans of Gettysburg had neither doubts nor hesitation in using deadly force on those whom they saw as traitors who were stabbing the Union cause in the back while the more honest rebels attacked at the front. The arrival of the battle-hardened troops quickly brought peace to the streets of New York. Democrats in the North faced difficult choices since they were well aware that to oppose the war outright meant their party risked political oblivion, as it had for the Federalist Party after the War of 1812. Some decided to go all-in and become supporters of the Lincoln administration's policies as well as of the war, 
These Democrats, led by Benjamin Butler from Massachusetts and Illinois' John McClernand, were rewarded by Lincoln for their support, with Butler and McClernand receiving commissions as generals. A second group of Democrats supported the war effort but broke with the Lincoln administration over its approach to emancipation, conscription, and the suspension of the writ of habeas corpus. A third group, a large portion of the Democratic Party in the North, denounced the war as wicked, foolish, and a failure. These peace Democrats, also known as Copperheads, urged compromise with the rebels through a negotiated settlement. Copperheads actually controlled the Indiana legislature and had considerable political strength in other states as well, and they criticized the war and obstructed measures for its support as much as they could. In the face of this opposition, Indiana's Republican governor, Oliver P. Morton, showed considerable determination and creativity in order to keep his state contributing to the Union war effort. Like other Democrats, Copperhead spoke out against emancipation, conscription, and Lincoln's extreme use of executive power. Confederate agents added fuel to the fire by encouraging such sentiments, since the rebels believed that a Copperhead victory at the polls would result in Confederate independence. Distressed as the Lincoln administration might have been by Copperhead criticism, what moved Republicans to question the loyalty of Copperheads was evidence that some of their activity went beyond the legitimate channels of political debate to talk of taking up arms against the government. Reports of Copperhead contact with Confederate agents also called into question their claims that they were merely a loyal opposition. Bolstering Copperhead optimism was the fact that Abraham Lincoln was up for re-election in the fall of 1864. There was never any question of postponing or canceling the election, and so northern voters were going to have the chance, in the middle of a war for the nation's survival, to express their opinion at the ballot box as to whether the war should continue. In 1864, in the North, the connection between politics and events on the battlefields would take center stage, as everyone acknowledged the presidential election would be a referendum on the war itself. Once the military campaigning season opened, if Confederate armies could thwart the advance of Union armies and inflict heavy casualties in doing so, the Northern electorate might become demoralized enough to elect a peace Democrat who would give up the war and accept Confederate independence. As we'll see, the year 1864 would be a pivotal one for both the North and the South on both the battlefields and the home fronts, as the cost in lives and money, in discomfort and sacrifices, mounted ever higher without any real sign on either side that reward in the shape of final victory was just around the corner. Men in their tens of thousands were killed and maimed. Prices spiraled upwards. Taxes multiplied. Treasured freedoms were repressed. Normal life was disrupted. And all to what purpose? Both the Lincoln administration in Washington and the Davis administration in Richmond struggled to bolster sagging popular support as opposition voices grew louder in both the Union and the Confederacy. During 1864, Lincoln will face an upsurge of discontent, especially in the Old Northwest, and a plague of war weariness throughout the Union. For the South, there will be ample evidence to show how tightly stretched were Confederate manpower and resources, how slender was the margin for the Confederacy's survival, and how heavy was the price already paid in pursuit of Southern independence. As we'll see during the course of the podcast, throughout most of the coming year, frustration and war weariness will be the great danger to Northern morale, but at the same time, 
despair will be gaining ground in the South. That means it's time for this episode's book recommendation, and our recommendation this time is a two-for-one deal. Both are by the editors of Time Life Books. The first is Confederate Ordeal, The Southern Home Front, and the second is 20 Million Yankees, The Northern Home Front. Both of these are part of the old, out-of-print Time Life series on the Civil War, which have those distinctive silver or gray, I guess, covers. Uh, But like all the books in that series, they're a good starting point or introduction for whatever topic they're covering. In this case, the Northern and Southern home fronts. Just a reminder that you can find a list of all of our book recommendations if you head over to the podcast website, which is www.civilwarpodcast.org. Also at the website, you can find info on joining the Strawfoot Brigade over on Patreon and support the podcast in that way. If you are a member of the Strawfoot Brigade, you'll keep getting all the members' episodes and new regular shows ad-free. As we wrap up this show, we'll remind you that the music you hear at the start and at the end of every episode is from the song Midnight on the Water, and we use it with the kind permission of Spiritwood Music. And with that, we'll say thank you for listening to this episode of the podcast. Tracy and I do hope that you join us again next time, but until then, take care. Thanks, everyone. Bye.